A lot of people complain about being burnt out. I don't blame them in, in today's economy and world events and everything and the amount of things on your to-do list, right? Mm -hmm. And you have family and you're trying to balance that with a career and or school or something else. But sometimes burnout is not about doing too much. Sometimes we're burnt out because we're doing too little of the things that light us up. Okay, Jim, I've been a fan of your work for years now. Um, I think I, not I think, I know that I read your book during COVID mm. and we did an Instagram live session. That was so much fun. It was amazing and so many people found so much value, so much, um, just a different perspective on brain health and how to even approach their brains. Um, and I love seeing that you continue to spread your teachings and your message and you are launching the expanded edition yeah. of Limitless, which is an amazing book packed with so much. Um, and I would love to dive a little bit more into the work that you've been doing. When I started and I reread the book again, uh, just to refresh my memory, I loved how you opened the book with this quote bar by uh, Mark Twain that says, don't let school interfere with your education. Mm. So I would love to hear when was the first time you heard that quote and how did it change the way you thought or approached your brain? I first heard it when I was 18 years old. Just some context. Sometimes it helps to have some background before some foreground. I had a traumatic brain injury when I was five. Because of it, I was put in some special education. I had processing issues but before I was very energized and curious and playful at five years old. And I had my accident and then I just shut down and um, had a lot of doubt, a lot of, lot of fears and shame and just wasn't like the other kids. Teachers would have to repeat themselves like three or four or five times. And then I still didn't understand, but I would pretend to understand. When I was nine years old, I was slowing down a class and being teased. And a teacher came to my defense and she pointed to me and said, leave that kid alone. That's the boy with the broken brain. And that label, you could say, became my limit. And so that was the context. And through all through school, I, I struggled all through elementary, middle, junior high, high school. Every single day, it was hard. And it, was, it wasn't because I didn't work hard. I worked really hard. I came from immigrant parents. My dad came here when he was 13, didn't speak the language. He lost both his parents. We lived in the back of a laundromat that my mom worked at. Everyone has their own story. But for me, I wanted to really make my parents proud. And they worked hard, so I worked hard. But I didn't get the kind of results I was expecting in school. I was on the other side of the bell curve, if you will. When I was 18, I was lucky enough to get into a local university, and I was like, okay, I'm going to do it. You know, a freshman meant I could make a fresh start. I could start over, show myself, the world, you know, that I'm, I'm, I'm capable. And I did worse, and it was, it was really kind of hard. I even feel it in my voice just kind of reliving this. And I wanted to quit school because I didn't have the money to be in school to begin with, and I'm the oldest of three siblings and I wanted to be a good role model and I'd rather, you know, my my brother, my sister have the resources to, to use it because I just wasn't smart enough. What happened was I a friend was like, hey, before you tell your folks you're going to quit, why don't you come home with me this weekend to visit my, I'm going to visit my family and get some perspective. And I found sometimes in life when you feel stuck, it helps to go to a different place or be around different people because it gives you a different point of view. And it definitely did for me. The family was pretty well off on the water and the father walks me around his property before dinner and he asked me a very simple question. He says, which is the worst question you could ask me at this time. He said, Jim, how's school? Mm -hmm. And I just, I'm pretty shy and introverted for, you know, personally. I start bawling and crying in front of this complete stranger because I have so much pent up, like, you know, just emotion that I haven't expressed and tell him about my whole story about having the broken brain and going to quit school because I can't, I can't make it here. And he says, very innocent question, another great question. He says, well, why are you in school? What do you want to, you know, no one's ever asked me that, you know, I just assume you go to school and that's, that's what everyone's, you know, supposed to do. And he said, I was like, well, he said, what do you want to be? What do you want to do? What do you want to have? What do you want to contribute to the world? And I didn't have any of those answers because nobody's ever asked me those questions before. And so he makes me do this exercise where I write it down on a piece of paper. And writing things down seems to be the first step in creating something. You take something invisible and you make it visible, 
right, mm-hmm. for the first time, and it's outside of yourself. And when I'm done with the exercise, I start folding up the sheets of paper. It's kind of like a bucket list, like, like my dreams. And I fold it to put it in my pocket, and he grabs the paper right out of my hand, and he starts reading it. And I'm freaking out because I've never shared those things with anybody, not another soul, mm. right? I didn't even, some of those things I didn't realize I wanted until I wrote them down. And I don't know how much time goes by, but he looks up at me and he says, Jim, you are this close to everything on that list. And people not watching on video, I'm spreading my index fingers like a foot apart. And I'm thinking, no way, give me 10 lifetimes, I'm not going to crack that list. And he takes his fingers and he puts them to the side of my head meaning what's in between was like the key, my, my brain, right? And he walks me into a room, and this is where the quote comes from, he walks me into a room of his home that I've never seen before. It is wall to wall, ceiling to floor, covered in books. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm able to read. It took me three years longer just to learn how to read when I was a kid after my brain injury. And so that's like being in a room full of snakes. It's very intimidating. Mm. And what makes it worse is he starts going to the shelves and pulling snakes off the shelf and handing them to me. And I'm looking at the books, and there are these biographies of some incredible women and men in history and some very early personal growth books, like The Power of Positive Thinking, like Norman Vincent Peale, Napoleon Hill, Dale Carnegie, right? And he says, Jim, leaders are readers. I want you to read one book a week. And I'm like, didn't you hear like all the things I have, you know, I have all these schoolwork and I'm not either broken brain. And when I say schoolwork, he told me that quote. He said, Jim, don't let school, you know, he said, get in the way of your education or interfere with your education. And I was like, wow. And I didn't realize it was a Mark Twain quote mm-hmm. at that time because this was over 30 years ago. I'm 50. So this was, yeah, this was at least 32 years ago. And I was like, that's very insightful, but still, I can't commit to doing it because, you know, my parents taught me to, to, you know, stick with my commitments and don't say it if you can't do it. I said, I'm sorry, I can't do it, you know, and then very smart man, he reaches out and takes out my dream list and he starts reading every single thing out loud and something, I just got goosebumps thinking about it. I call them truth bumps. Mm. It's one of those things where you're, when you hear your dreams spoken by another person out incanted into the the universe, it messed with my mind, my heart, my spirit, something fierce. And there were a lot of things on that list that I wanted to do for my family, things they could never afford, or even if they had the money, they wouldn't do for themselves. So with that motivation and that purpose, I go back to school and I'm sitting at my desk and I have a pile of books I have to read for midterms and everything and a pile of books I promise to read. And I already couldn't get through pile A. So what do I do? I don't eat. I don't sleep. I don't work out. I don't socialize, go to parties. I just live in the library for weeks and weeks. And one night is the end of the story. I pass out and I fall down a flight of stairs at 2 a.m. in the library. And I woke up in the hospital It's about two days later. And at this point, I'm down like 117 pounds. I've lost all this weight. I'm hooked up to all these IVs and malnourished, I'm dehydrated. And I thought I died. And it was the darkest time in my life. And when I said there has to be a better way, the nurse came out with a mug of tea and on it was a picture of Albert Einstein, pretty smart person. There's a quote, another quote, that said, the same level of thinking that has created your problem won't solve your problem. And it made me ask a new question because I think questions are the answer, right? From my Mm -hmm. mentor, from this mug. And it, I was like, well, my problem is I'm a very, I have a broken brain. I'm a very slow learner. And I was like, well, how do I think differently about it? Maybe I could fix my brain. Maybe I could learn how to learn better. And that took me on that journey. I really started focusing on brain science, adult learning theory. I wanted to know not just lead a science about learning, but what did people do, like the ancient wisdom? What did people do before there were printing presses or before the internet? How they remember things? And I started studying like ancient Greece and saw the mnemonic, you know, techniques that they use. Within 60 days of studying speed reading and memory and a light switch flipped on and I started to really understand things for the very first time in my life. And my grades shot up, but not not only that, but my my confidence in myself. Mm, can imagine. Yeah. And then I started helping people and tutoring. And the reason why I'm here with you today and I write these books and podcasts and courses is because one of those students I started tutoring, she was a freshman, she read 30 books in 30 days. I wanted to find out not how, I taught her how, and we teach it in the book, but 
I want to know why. What was her purpose? Mm -hmm. And it was also her family. Her mother had terminal cancer, was given two months to live, and the books she was reading were books to save her mom's life. And she ended up doing so. And when I heard that, I realized that if knowledge is power, then learning is our superpower. And it's a superpower all of us have. Whoever's listening to this, watching this, regardless of your age, your background, your career, education level, your financial situation, your gender, your history, your IQ, we all could do things. We have genius inside of us, but there are not a lot of classes in school. We were talking about other forms of education before we started recording that teach you like how to learn. They teach mm-hmm. you what to learn, math and history and science and Spanish, but there are no classes on how to learn it more effectively. And so I've dedicated my life to helping bring that to people. Absolutely. And I'm just curious to understand the moment because it sounds like you had that shift when you started to ask the questions. You started looking at the quotes, right? Because right. I'm sure those quotes were all around you before as well. What was that moment of you even noticing that quote on the cup? So imagine 18 years old, very insecure, very sick in a hospital bed. I find that sometimes those places where you're at your lows, you're, you're, you're open and more receptive to new ideas, new mm-hmm. thoughts, potentially even new actions because you have nowhere to go. I feel like I mean, you exhausted just everything you knew, right? Yeah, yeah. and I couldn't, I couldn't work any harder, right? And mm-hmm. it's not just the, tech, the methods. It's, my motivation was fine. You know, I was very driven, but I didn't know what to do because I always thought you know, school would prepare you for that world, and it does in some ways. But you know, the world has changed so much. You know, we live in an age of autonomous electric cars, spaceships are headed to Mars, but our vehicle of choice when it comes to education and learning is often like more like a horse and buggy. Mm-hmm, you know, and it, and it feels like it's slow. You know, and so if anyone's listening to this and they get distracted or they're forgetful or they feel overload, I'm here to say that there's not only hope, there's there's real help. When I think about my journey with the traditional school system. It's been a very informal, <laughs> informal journey. I did what I needed to do to get by. Yeah. I always felt like I was smart, but I couldn't quite unlock that motivation or will to excel. Yeah. And I think when I think back to my years at school, the one thing that keeps on coming up for me was the teachers always telling me or my mother, she has so much potential. And that saying of like she has so much potential was like dangling in front of me at all Mm. times and I just couldn't catch it and it's to your point where no one teaches you how to grab that potential right so just acknowledging that you're smart and you have capabilities and you're able I feel like it even creates a bit of a worse uh, relationship with your own brain because you get frustrated you get angry at why is this not working when it's supposed to I think that there's probably a lot of moments in our lives, if it's throughout the school years or later on in general, when we're presented with these opportunities to learn, a lot of the times we still carry that, you know, dangling potential that you're just like, oh my God, it's so close, but yet it's so far. Yeah, I feel that. And how do you reconcile that, you know, inside of yourself when people tell you that you're worthy or that you can do it? And you're trying things. It's not like you're lazy, Mm -hmm. but you're not able to get the results, you know. And for me, I felt like it was almost unfair to when I was working and pulling all these all nighters, and other people were partying and doing all these things, and they were doing better than myself. And that really, you know, you don't have any evidence to to the contrary that you're not, you know, that you are smart or that you do have this potential because the world is showing you different. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, anybody who's going through this, I really do believe with challenge comes a level of change, that our struggles can lead to strength, you know, and and that adversity can be an advantage. I mean, for me, my two biggest challenges growing up were learning, for sure. But because I was such a poor learner, public speaking was, was my second biggest challenge because I never knew the answer. You know, my my superpower, and I talk a lot about superpowers because I'm inspired by comic books because I couldn't read and I taught myself how to read by reading comic books. And But I, my superpower was shrinking down. Like even my physiology was like I was always like trying to take up less space because I mm. didn't want the spotlight. I didn't want to be called on in class. 
I would always sit behind the tall kid in class so I just wouldn't be noticed. You know, it created a lot of angst and sickness even, you know, going to the nurse, just I would have so much anxiety taking a test or, you know, being called on, those kind of things. So it's, it's, it's tough. And, and, but I also know I have this observation doing this for over 30 years now as a brain coach, helping people at different levels and ages and stages that I've never met one strong person that had an easy life. Like I, I really haven't. Absolutely. I was listening to this uh, podcast episode with the author that writes, he wrote the biography for Ben Franklin, Benjamin Franklin, and for Elon Musk. Oh, Walter Isaacson? Yes. Yeah. It was a podcast episode where uh, with Lex Friedman, I think, and they were talking about how the most remarkable people have the most difficulty in life, comes with mm. the most demons in a way, because that really pushes you to create a new world for yourself. Yeah. And that was really interesting to me, I mean, we all know it, that adversity is can be strength, but um, just thinking about it of how remarkable, uh, such remarkable resu- results that come out from such difficulties, yeah. um, it's always just a good thing to um, think about. And, you know, when people say, like even for me, thinking about expanding my mind and knowledge is usually framed in increasing your IQ. It's very much focused on that. But I feel like it's not the focus of your teaching. Yeah. You have so many layers to the limitless Mm -hmm. approach. And in your book, you said becoming limitless is not just about accelerated learning, speed reading, and having an incredible memory. It's about progressing beyond what you currently believe is possible. So the, the word limitless, which is, you know, limitless expanded is, is the title of the new book. Limitless is not about being perfect. It is exactly what you describe. It's about advancing. Mm-hmm. It's about growing. It's about progressing beyond what you are currently demonstrating or what you currently believe is possible. And certainly people could improve their IQ by using these strategies. If you take an IQ test and you have a better memory, a lot of it is based on memory and creativity, and we teach that in there. But my, my message for people is there's always, there's always a method behind what looks like magic. Like when I go on stage and I'm in front of a quarter million people total a year, you know, I'm, I'm not, I could be on three continents in one week, which is interesting because, again, the fear of public speaking, life has a sense of humor because all I do Truly. is public <laughs> speak and on this thing called learning. But I get a lot of feedback. And we have an, the largest online academy of accelerated learning and brain optimization in the world. Every you know, student's in every country. Um, and so we get a lot of feedback. And I, and I realize that while IQ is important, so is our, our other areas. You're right. In the United States, even if you look at standardized tests, like the SATs, which are very, you know, you know, people take to be able to get into university. It has uh, two parts, only two parts. It has verbal, linguistic, and mathematical. So basically, if you're not strong in those two areas, then you know it's it could it could hamper you know, your achievement. Mm-hmm. And there's an idea with IQ that your IQ is fixed, meaning like it's like your shoe size; it can't grow, and that's absolutely not true. Like we've discovered more about the human brain in the past 20 years than the previous 2,000 years. And what we found is we're grossly underestimating our own capabilities. That, you know, your genius, your knowledge, your skills, abilities can all be upgraded. It's just we don't have the lessons. It's like going to your children or going to somebody and say, focus mm-hmm. or study. That's like going to somebody and say, play the ukulele, who's never seen it, who's never got a class on how to do that. When, when we're there was no class called focus and concentration in school. There was no class called problem solving or decision making or critical thinking or speed reading or, or even memory wasn't taught. And I, the reason I like memory is because in order to make good decisions, you have to make you know you it's based on the knowledge that you recall. And so you know I always thought in in the U.S. they teach you three R's: reading, writing, arithmetic. Obviously, spelling is not one of them because that doesn't even start with start with an R. Mm-hmm. But what about recall? You know, Socrates said. Here's another quote: Socrates said, "Learning is remembering," and mm-hmm. and I believe two of the most costly words to people watching this right now are "I forgot." 
you know, think about the consequence of just always saying, I forgot to do it. I forgot what I was going to say. I forgot what they told me, that conversation. I forgot that meeting. I forgot that name. I mean, it just goes on and on. On the other side, though, when you have a trained memory, and I do believe there's no such thing as a good or bad memory, there's a trained memory and an untrained memory, then wow, what if you could easily remember what you read? What if you could easily remember names and faces? You know, how would that serve you? What if you could easily give a speech without notes, right? And how much confidence would you have at your work or in school? What if you could remember client information or product information? And so I like to uh, open up the possibility because you mentioned the, the mind. And so many people, they shrink what's possible to fit their minds as opposed to expanding their minds to fit all that's that's really possible. Mm. And that's more the spirit of, you know, what it means to be limitless for me. Can you repeat what you just said? Yeah. A lot of people are... They, they Out of fear because of what's going on in the world or their current economic conditions, what they'll do is they'll shrink what's possible to fit their minds as opposed to doing the opposite. What if you expanded the mind to be able to fit all of what's possible? You know, I really think sometimes we downgrade our dreams to meet the current situation. When I think, and on the other side, instead of downgrading your dreams and your goals to meet the current situation, what if you upgraded your mindset, your motivation, the methods you're using to be able to meet your destiny? Do you think it, is it just programming or is there um, an aspect of fear? So there are three areas you need to address to become more limitless. And, and one of them would address the fear, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So if everybody, we turn this into a little master class. Okay, so Limitless is about advancing and progressing. It's not about being perfect. Nobody's perfect, right? But there's a science and an art to our lives. And if you feel like you're not progressing, the opposite is you're stalled, you're stuck, right? So imagine you feel stuck in a box in some area of your life. Because some areas are progressing, right? But maybe some areas aren't. So think about everyone who's listening an area of your life where you're not making progress. Maybe it's your career. Maybe it's your income. Maybe it's your impact, right? Maybe it's your creativity. Maybe it's your learning, your reading speed, your memory, whatever. You feel stuck. Now, that box is, by definition, it's three-dimensional, right? It's a cube. So the three things that hold that box together are the same three forces that will liberate you out of that box. And so I call it the limitless model, And I feel like it's it was the framework that we introduced to the to the world to go beyond your limits, to redraw the borders and boundaries of what's what's really possible, to tap mm -hmm. more of that potential that you were told that you you had, but you didn't know how to access. So the three dimensions, the first one is mindset, right? Because the last one's gonna be the methods. That's what to do. Right. You know, mm -hmm. in my case, there's chapters on focus, methods for speed reading, for memory, for for all the, all the different things. But you have to address the mindset first because the mindset determines what's possible. Like your mindset I define as the set of assumptions or attitudes about something. So if somebody has assumptions and attitudes about money, I know that's, that's a big focus for a lot yeah. of people. They believe at some level out of fear or just programming, you mentioned that money is the root of all evil, or in order to make money, you have to take advantage of people. I'm just making this up, mm -hmm. right? So if that's the mindset, then you're never going to use the methods of sales or entrepreneurship or social media marketing because you're still contained in that box because you don't believe it's possible, or you believe if you made money, you're hurting people, right? Mm -hmm. So there has to be some kind of rewashing of that, that, those, that negative thinking. I call them lies, you know, these lies that we buy into. Because for me, uh, everything's an acronym. A lie stands for a limited idea entertained. It's not true that money is the root of all evil or that you have to hurt people. I mean, certainly you could find cases, right? Yeah. But the, the question is, is this useful for me to entertain, right? So it's a limited idea that you're entertaining. That's a lie. Like for learning, a lot of people think that geniuses are just born, Right. And when I say geniuses, it could be geniuses in math or reading, but it also could be music or athletics or something. But it's been my experience studying and teaching high performance that genius is not born as much as it's built, you know, through discipline, through training, through consistency, right? Mm -hmm. And so the first part of it is you need to change those lies. 
And then once you know what's holding you back, then there are a lot of tools that we talk about in the book. You have self-hypnosis, you have you have tapping, you know, EFT, you have EMDR. Tech, there's so many resources to do the reprogramming, and we introduce a lot of them in there because the mindset, your brain is this incredible supercomputer, and your self-talk and your thoughts are the program it will run. So if you say to yourself, I'm not good at remembering people's names. You won't remember the name of the next person you meet because you just program your computer not to, right? right. And so that's the power of the mind. At, at events, I'll often, I mentioned, do those demonstrations, mental demonstrations, remember people's names and everything. And at a break, people will say, I'm so glad you're here. You know, you're the memory expert. I have a horrible memory. And then I would say, I would say stop. If you fight for your limitations, you get to keep them, mm -hmm. right? And if you fight for your limits, they're yours, right? And so many of us are fighting for what we can't do, and then nothing happens, right? And so that that's what mindset is. For me, mindset comes down to this idea that all behavior is belief-driven. If you want to create a new result in your life to get out of that box, make more money, get 100,000 followers on Instagram, whatever it happens to be, you need to new, do new behaviors. Mm -hmm. But in order to do that behavior, you need a belief that says that's even possible, Otherwise, you're not even going to do it. It just reminded me, um, with Gen Z, I find that they recognized a way to get to that re restructuring of the mindset without actually calling it that. Um, and I don't know if you've seen it around, but you know, we're in the era of, they call it the Lulu, which is basically being delusional. Okay. <laughs> but it very much just gives an opportunity for people to believe in something bigger, to believe mm. that they can do more, that they can say more, that they can act against their, you know, their believed kind of right. presence. Um, exactly. So they're just doing things that are outside of their character. But when you think about character, it's just outside of their belief system, outside of their box. Right. But instead of making it this big thing of like, I have to rewire my brain, they're just putting on this Delulu hat and go and do all the things. So and they're, they're acting as, as, as if kind of like exact, they were that. Yeah. Exactly. Until it became becomes the reality. So it's a bit of a fake it till you make it mm -hmm. with that restructuring of the mindset, you know, without calling it that. Yeah, I, I wish I had that idea a little bit back when I was struggling <laughs> with mine and just kind of could could pretend that was me until I saw evidence that mm -hmm. really built that. And so there's so many ways of getting there, right, uh, to get to this same place, so many different roads to be able to take. But the first thing you need to know, in order to make any kind of change, you have to you have to have self-awareness. Yeah. You, know, you need to know like what you currently believe, what you currently value, and, and also self-awareness in terms of how you operate. You know, we, we created this assessment for people to understand their brain type, and that's a form of self-awareness. But that's why people go to therapy or they meditate or they journal just so they get to know themselves a little bit better. Get more information. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's this part in The Matrix where Neo goes to see the oracle in the kitchen and the sign above in the kitchen was like, know thyself. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's, it's very telling. I think a lot of life is having the curiosity to know yourself. And then the other part of life is having the courage, to, you know, to be yourself. You know, once you get to know who you are, what you value, what you believe, your identity, and then being that person, because so many people kind of get a glimpse of that of their potential, or their strengths, or their 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 you know, like their superpowers, if you will. But also, it takes courage to act on it too. Absolutely. In a world full of, you know, comparison, in a world full of other people's expectations and. What are people going to think, their opinions of me, if I mm -hmm. do this new thing? Even the ability, and I was having a conversation yesterday with a friend of mine, but to give yourself permission to change the way you view yourself, the way other people view you, it's also part of that fear, right? And it's yeah. part of that, that expansion has to happen when you yeah. are allow yourself, yourself to go through this journey. Yeah. Um, so it's really beautiful. One thing that um, I absolutely loved in the book is the power of asking the right question. Hmm. That to me was a big aha moment. Yeah. I mean, going back to that story where I had that mentor and all of a sudden this person was was asking me questions that I've never been asked before. And simple idea, if you ask a new question that you've never asked, you're going to get a new answer you've never gotten before. 
because what it does is we have about 60,000 thoughts a day, roughly. And a lot of those thoughts come in the form of questions that we're asking ourselves. In fact, thinking is this process of asking questions and answering questions. And if people are listening or watching and they say, is that true? Notice in order to think about it, you had to ask the question, is it true? Mm -hmm. Right. So we're always asking these questions. Now, the brain is primarily a deletion device. And what I mean by that is, for most part, we're trying to keep information out because if we let everything in, we would be overloaded. We'd have so much anxiety because there are a billion things that we could focus on at any given time. So what do we let in? We let in the things that we care about. And so you have a part of your brain, I and mean, we're gonna, gonna do a whole brain anatomy, but you have part of your brain called a reticular activating system, RAS. And that determines what you're gonna focus on. And for me, focus is like this glowing ball where it's like a sh you shine a spotlight on things, right? And so one of the ways of accessing that RAS, like for example, we're programmed our reticular activating system to respond to our name. When you hear your name, because that was one of the first words you heard and were probably one of the early words you learned to spell and or say, and think about the love you, and encouragement you're given behind a name. They say a name is the sweetest sound to a person's ears, right? So our RAS is primed to, to, to pay attention when we hear it, even if we know it's not directed towards us. Right. I was running a marathon years ago in Washington, DC. And, you know, around mile 18, I heard someone say, Go, Jim. And I looked and I know I didn't know that person, right? Because I didn't recognize them, but I still look because my I'm trained to look. Mm -hmm. Now we could also train our brains to look for opportunities, the things that could enhance uh, our relationships, the things opportunities to to grow a business, right? And so how do you train it? With questions. And most of us are asking questions that probably aren't the absolute best questions to get us for closer to where we want to go. So for example, I have a, one of the techniques in the book talks about your dominant question. And this is a question you ask more than any other question. And everybody has one. If not one, they have a few of them. And we do it, we ask these questions hundreds of times a day, either consciously or unconsciously. And so, and as an example, a friend of mine, we were going through this exercise and, you know, I was asking her what she thinks her dominant question is. And she was thinking about it a little bit and we were just kind of workshopping it. And she says, I know what my dominant question is. It's how do I get people to like me? Mm. All the time throughout the day, throughout the weeks and the months for, for years, she asked that question, how do I get this person to like me? Now, everyone who's listening and watching, you don't know this person, right? You don't know what they do. You don't know what they look like, where they live. Or anything. You don't know it, but you know a lot about that person just because you know that one question. question. So if you're, if somebody's asking themselves all the time, how do I get people to like me? What would you say their personality is like? How would you have, how would, what would you think they would be like if someone's always trying to get that person to like them? People pleasing. Mm -hmm. Um, She's a big people pleaser. Yeah, the need to for outside validation. Mm -hmm. um, I would say loss of identity a little bit. Yeah, so she's always looking for other people to, to validate her. Mm -hmm. And her identity, it changes depending on who she's spending time mm -hmm. with because she wants them to like. So she she starts having the interests of the people who are around her, even that I mean, it's not her interests or even in her relationship because she wants that person to really like her. Right. Mm -hmm. um, she's also gets taken advantage of a lot because she's a martyr. She's always trying to people please. And, you know, as you mentioned, so people are always kind of taking advantage of her, unfortunately, because that's her dominant question. And so we all have a dominant question. For me, growing up, you know, with my injury, it was always how do I shrink down? How do I not be noticed? Right. How do I not be seen? Because I didn't want to be seen. Well, I probably did deep down want to be seen. We all yeah. do, right? And be heard. But because of my fear, I didn't want that. And later on, my question evolved. And that's a good news. Your questions can change you know, when you start asking new questions. It eventually became, because I thought I was broken, I was like, my, my question is, how do I fix myself? Mm. Right. Then my question became, how do I make this better? And then my question became, how do I teach this to other people? And I started getting answers. It's like... Like years ago, I have a younger sister, and she would send me postcards and emails with a very specific breed of dog. It was a pug dog. And 
And my question was, why, for the longest, for like a couple of weeks, I was like, my, my question was, like, why keep, she keeps on sending me these photos? And I realized uh, her birthday was coming up, right? And she's a really good marketer. <laughs> and so <laughs> the funny thing happened, though, in my reality, I started seeing these pug dogs everywhere. I would be at the checkout counter at the Whole Foods or wherever, and the person in front of me is carrying a pug dog. I'd be running in my neighborhood jogging and somebody's walking six pug dogs, right? And my question for everyone listening is, did those pug dogs just magically appear in my neighborhood? No, they were always there, but I was deleting it. It wasn't important to me until I started asking the questions. Now, how do you take this into your learning? Well, how many people have ever read a page in a book, got to the end, and just forgot what they just read? A lot of people, right? A lot of people, And then yeah. they reread it, and they still know what they just read. Mm -hmm. But what if you had questions, and you're like about what you're reading, and then all of a sudden, oh, there's a pug dog, there's a pug dog, there's a pug dog, right? Mm. And so my challenge for everybody listening would be, let's, when you're quiet or when you're stressed, and just realize your self-talk, and what questions are you asking yourself on repeat consistently? And then just ask yourself another question, is this question serving me, right? Another good question is, what's the best use of this moment? You know, mm -hmm. how do I do this easier, right? Peter Thiel, who wrote a book, he's a famed angel investor. He wrote a book called Zero to One. And his primary question is, how do I reach my 10-year goal in six months, right? And you're going to get a different quality answer because you can't work your way harder to get to that 10-year goal, right. right? You have to work smarter. But that question allows that answer to be able to appear. You know, somebody like um, innovators and creators who are listening to this right now, there's a book called The Structure of Scientific Revolution, very complex book. Um, but it says that all innovation usually comes from people outside of an industry because it takes somebody outside who didn't have the same learning and all the restrictions and learned helplessness to look in and say, why aren't we doing it this way? Right. Ask a different question. Yeah. yeah. Like an Elon Musk, like looking at the automotive industry. With today's technology, how would we build a car? Mm -hmm. Right. And then you get different answers and then you have a different life. I love how you said that the world will always find evidence to confirm our beliefs. So yeah. the question that you ask to your point, the universe will always present you. Very much so. If somebody's asking the question, why does this always happen to me? You're mm. going to find a whole lot of evidence all the time. Or why can't I lose this weight? Or why can't I make money? You're going to say, oh, because of this, because I'm not smart enough. And you'll come up with answers. Mm -hmm. And so and on the opposite is also true. If you ask empowering questions, you're going to get better answers and evidence, you know, to, to the contrary, that would just be supportive of that new identity and that new mindset. And in order to be able to identify the dominant question, we have yeah. to get to a place of quiet. It could be a place of quiet and you know, meditation where we think about the consistency of our thoughts, or it could also come in places of stress. Like when, when we're faced with a difficulty and demand and we're angry, what are the questions we're asking ourselves when we're triggered? Like why, why does he or she always do this to me, right? Or you know, these kind of questions. So when you're under, under use, it could come from a place of calm, but it could also come from a place of, of challenge also as well. So when we're, when we're stressed, when we have anxiety, what are the questions we're asking ourselves? What, and so self-awareness is really a superpower. You repeat, uh, you have a whole chapter actually about the downtime. Downtime is key yeah. for uh, brain growth, um, yeah. better memory, clarity, energy. And I have to say that's a challenging one for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> downtime is um, extremely challenging, not impossible, but uh, you know the world I feel like is at this point engineered to really take away as much attention as it can, yeah. right? There's always things that are trying to come in. So how do you go about it, creating yeah. that downtime for your brain? So the downtime can be minutes or it could be hours or it could be, you know, an extended period of time. And the, the idea behind this is people think that they have to be doing things all the time so they could be productive. But the truth is when you really look at the activities people are doing, a lot of times you have to distinguish between being productive towards a goal that's fulfilling to you and being busy, right? A lot of, a lot of us are just busy. When, when you look at it, if it's taking you closer to the things that you want most in life. You know, in fact, I think a lot of people complain about being burnt out. 
And I don't blame them in, in today's economy and world events and everything and the amount of things on your to-do list, right? Mm -hmm. And you have family and you're trying to balance that with a career and or school or something else. So I think burnout, yes, it could come from doing having too much to do, but sometimes burnout is not about doing too much. Sometimes we're burnt out because we're doing too little of the things that that matter or too little of the things that light us up or too little of the things that that nourish us or, 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 or feed our soul, right? Mm. So yes, you have a to-do list, but I think it's also useful to have a not to-do list. You know, there's all kinds of research, like there's a good book called uh, Good to Great by Jim Collins. And I mention a lot of books because I, if people seen me with on social media with Oprah or Elon or these individuals, people always ask how we bonded and we bonded over books, right? Because you read to succeed. If somebody has decades of experience in a topic and they take the time and energy to put, to put into a book and somebody can read that book in a few days, you could download decades into days, which is such an advantage, right? And so that's why my mentor, you know, told me to read all these books to change my mindset and the, my motivation, my methods. So going back to this downtime, your brain is not meant to go at full speed all the time. It's just not, just like your body isn't, you know, or a car, you know, F1, they take, they have to take pit stops, right? To mm -hmm. recover, to repair, to rejuvenate. And also in this downtime is also the time where you can be most creative. So I don't feel like self-care or creativity is non-productive. If anything, you're going to perform much better than somebody who doesn't take those breaks. But I agree in today's society with all the rings and pings and dings and abnovigation, and everybody <laughs> has access to us 24 seven, right? It can be very stressful. So part of self-care is not just going to the spa or eating the best brain foods and meditating. Part of self-care is when you say yes to somebody or something, you're not saying no to yourself. It's not even just about time management because time is the one thing we all have the same. Not this, The truth is not everything is equal. If we're going to be honest, not everybody has same income. Not everybody has the same education. Not everybody has the same network, right? Everybody has different, but we all have 24 hours in a day, right? And it's how we utilize that and invest that time to things that make difference for us. Who am I to say what people should be doing? But my coaching would be, is this getting closer to what makes you happy? and your goals, or is it taking you further away? And I think it's good to have a not to do list. I have this video on Facebook, it has 37 million views, and it's just saying, hey, why don't we just not grab our phones the first 30 minutes of the day? And I know I'm hitting people like they feel attacked <laughs> right now, but uh, from a brain perspective, is that's where I come from. When you wake up, you're in this relaxed state of awareness. You're, you're, you're very suggestible, right? Because you're because you're calm and you're relaxed, right? You haven't started the whole day, and if the first thing you do is pick up your phone, you wire your brain for two things that are hurting your performance and peace of mind. Number one, you're rewiring your brain for distraction, because every like, share, comment, caveat, whatever, it's just driving you. It's that dopamine flood, and you flex your distraction muscles, and that's what focus is. It's a muscle, and so is distraction. And then you wonder why you can't focus in a meeting or with your kids because the first thing you'd started the day with was being distracted and you take that distraction everywhere because how you do anything is how you do everything. But the other thing it wires your brain for is not only distraction, which hurts your productivity and performance and peace, but also you wire yourself for reaction. I mean, just think about it. Have you ever picked up your phone first thing and then you get a message, voicemail, text, WhatsApp, social media message, whatever, and it just hijacks your day for hours? Right. Every day this week, Jim. Yeah. Every day this week. And that, but but and you feel when you're saying that you feel the consequence of that. Yeah. And I'm not saying that phones aren't important. We need to know things that are you know that mm -hmm. are urgent and important. But for the most part, a lot of that stuff falls in a bucket where it's not important. And then all of a sudden, what are we doing to our bodies and our brains? We are. We start the morning with on being on the defense. We're fighting fires, right? And we're being reactive as opposed to proactive. And how are you going to have a quality life full of hitting your dreams and your goals and your happiness if we're just reacting to everything, right? And I have a friend named Brendan. He wrote Motivation Manifesto, another great book. And he says, your inbox is nothing but a convenient organizational system for other people's agenda for your life, right? Wow. Yeah. I, goosebumps again, truth bumps. But I'm here to say, like, don't get to your phone, but just give yourself like 30 minutes 
to kind of plan your day. What I do on the opposite, what's on test mind not to do is don't touch my phone the last 30 minutes a day and the first 30 minutes a day because I also don't want to be on my phone right before I go to sleep because that mm-hmm. wires me in a different way. On your day, on your to-do, start your day. What if you did this? And I challenge everyone to do this and then post it on social. If you know your results, tag us both so we get to see you know, how it worked for you. But what if you started your day, you're in bed, and you did this thought experiment, just 30 seconds. You fast forward to the end of the day and just imagine you're at the end of the day and somebody asks you a question. Questions are the answer. And they say something simple like, how was your day? And I want you to imagine yourself saying, this was the, an amazing day. You know, uh, we crushed it today. It was amazing, incredible. And then work backwards. What had to happen in order for you to feel that way? So what I narrow it down to is not my 200 things on my to-do list, but what are three things personally and three things professionally? Just six things that made that day great. And I work backwards. So I have a goal. And so instead of being reactive throughout the day, I'm focused on those six things. And those they don't have to be big things. It could be, hey, I'm gonna walk, I'm gonna walk the dogs and you know, take fit that 15 minute time to myself. Mm-hmm. Right. But it's not about even time management, it's about priority management. Like I really do with believe with our brain, it's about mastering our minds, about mind management. And here's the thing for priority management. The most important thing is to keep the most important thing the most important thing. <laughs> that is the most important thing, right? Because you don't want to get really good at things that don't matter, mm-hmm. right? And so that's the kind of mindset I'm, I'm thinking about when it comes to uh, you know, technology and a not to-do list and having that time. And I would, the last thing I would say is, is schedule your white space. Schedule it. Like you schedule your parent-teacher conferences, a doctor's appointment, investor meetings, right? You schedule your work, Zooms, or whatever, but we don't schedule time for ourselves. Like what if, it doesn't have to be like an hour. What if you just scheduled 20 minutes, hey, this is time, I'm going to get off my devices, I'm going to disconnect so I could reconnect. And I guarantee you that white space over time is when you're going to be most creative. It's when you're going to be most rejuvenated. You're going to do some of your best thinking in that white space. I love the exercise you just mentioned of actually working backwards Mm -hmm. uh, for your day. I think that just even when you were doing the exercise, I felt a sense of clarity. I think it just gives like some kind of a flow and structure to the day that will help navigate even the way you react to things and move through the day. Um, That's beautiful. I'm definitely going to do this. There is... This quote, I see, I I love quotes. Uh, (laughs) Me too. um, That really defines the gaps that we have in traditional education. The self-regulation looks different for everyone and has varying degrees of what work needs to be done within you to be able to reach your full potential. Because that full potential can look different for every person. Yeah. This is really important, and I'm glad you found that and really highlighted it for yourself. Just what I'll say for this is um, self-regulation or emotional management, state regulation. It's not. It's not. Another, it's another thing not really taught in school. But the reminder here is: we, while you have a to-do list, and now everybody has like a not to-do list. <laughs> I would also say you, we need a to-feel list, right? And on your to-feel list, the se- the sequence for success. And I, I'm, I'm open to debate this with with, with listeners. Is is be, do, have, and then if you're inclined, share, right? And so many people want to jump to the have point, right? They want to have a um, hundred thousand followers, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Or that's why they they play the lottery, right? Because they want to jump to the have. And I'm no no judgment for people who play the lottery, but they want to jump to the have point. And what? And even with the lottery, they want to have millions of dollars. What happens after someone wins the lottery over time, invariably? What's the average? Is they lose all that money and more, all right? Because they jumped to the half point, but they were never being and doing. Mm-hmm. They were never being, they, they, they have millions of dollars, but they were never being a millionaire. And they were never doing the things that a millionaire would do. So they didn't get to keep what they have, right? Much less to be able to share. And I feel like part of that being point is also your identity, they say the two most important words, powerful words in the English language are the shortest, I am. Because anything after that determines like your reality, right? But it's also part of your I am is how you feel on a regular basis. Because all learning is state dependent, 
meaning that if you learn something in a frustrated state, you're not going to re- probably retain much of it. If you learn it in a bored state, you're probably not going to retain much of it. And that's the problem with a lot of education because information by itself is very forgettable, but information tied with emotions become unforgettable. And so hopefully with the book, a lot of people learn strategies to incorporate. So they, they we forget what we hear. We heard a name, right? We forget a name, but we tend to remember what we see we saw a face, we remember a face. And what you feel, you'll never forget. Mm-hmm. Meaning there's a, a Maya Angelou, one of, my, one of my favorite poets, she says, people will forget what you say, they'll forget what you did, they'll always remember how you made them feel. It's right? my favorite quote. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, I know you love quotes. <laughs> <laughs> and so the emotion is so very important. So going back to, you know, your 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 management of your own self and, you know, of, of your, you want to manage your being and your doing, right? And also your feeling. And so having it to feel list, because when you're faced in, with a difficulty or demand, most people say, what do I need to do? And that's a reasonable question. But let's say you're having an argument with your spouse and you know, what am I going to say? What am I going to do? What if you instead you say, what do you want to feel? It's like, okay, I, I want to feel compassionate. Then the doing takes care of itself right? It's going to be organic or, you know, I am compassionate, right? Or I am loving. And then the behaviors take care of themselves. So I think it's important for us to cultivate certain feelings because here is the first principle. The first principle, the core principle behind this is you don't have feelings, you do them. You don't have focus, you do it. You don't have energy, you do it. There you generate energy. You don't even have motivation that I talk about in the book, which is a huge section. You do it. There's a process for motivating yourself and others, mm-hmm. right? So you don't have to wake up one day and just say, oh man, I hope tomorrow I I wake up and I have creativity so I can make these videos and make these posts and do all this stuff because you don't have creativity, you do it. And when we take the nouns in our life and we turn them into verbs, then we have a lot of power. Because having something is a noun, but doing something is a verb. So we say, okay, I don't have motivation, I do it. And then all of a sudden, what does it do? It gives you your agency back and you could self-manage yourself. Because it's all about ownership. Where you're a thermostat, you're not a thermometer. Think about it. A thermometer reacts to the environment. If there was a thermometer on the wall, it would just react to whatever the environment is giving it. And human beings, sometimes we react to the economy, to the weather, to whatever people treat us. But the happiest people, they identify more with the thermostat because the thermostat, what is its function? It doesn't react to the environment. It gauges, it knows the temperature. So I'm not saying don't pay attention, but what does it do? It sets a temperature and what happens to the environment? The environment reacts to you, Mm. right? And we could set a standard. We could set a goal. We could set a personal vision for ourselves. And, you know, for people who are creatives, right? Or entrepreneurs or parents, you know, they could set this vision and then have the environment reflect your vision. That's very powerful. I am definitely going to work on recognizing when to change my language of the, to a verb, right? Of I'm not motivated today. I haven't done motivation today. Right. Exactly. I think that something simple like that, it just feels different. Even little things like words like Oh, I, I got to pick up the kids or I got to work out. I, I got to schedule this, you know, time offline or whatever. If you change the word from got to get, it feels different. I get to pick up my kids today, right? Mm-hmm. I get to journal. I get to work out. I get to have this 10 minutes to myself. It, it's, it's different. So vocabulary, the words we use affect our thoughts and that affects our feelings and our behaviors and in our whole life. I want to touch on the concept of productivity because it's yeah. a big buzzword. I feel like been a big buzzword, uh, especially with the hustle culture becoming, you know, so big and gets to a lot of impressionable minds. Right. I think that we're got to this point where we're just kind of trying to achieve this level of productivity to feel like we are doing enough, like we're participating in every day. And we became obsessed with it. It, It's a little bit overwhelming, even for me, someone who is, I consider myself being very self-aware. I find myself that I sometimes get too tangled with this whole concept of productivity. Is there a tool that 
we can use, even the way our mindset works about productivity that can make yeah. it a pleasurable experience rather yeah, than a yeah. negative one. I mean, even if we review some of the tools that we've talked about, you know, our thoughts affect everything and the questions we ask, mm-hmm. right? Even asking a question like, so what's driving that productivity is probably a question that you're asking yourself, right? It could be like, how do I do this better or whatever it happens to be. You know, so even breaking that pattern and asking a new question or inquiry could help you get a little bit more peace. I believe in in the 80-20 rule, right? Uh, For the most part, they call it the Pareto principle, that 20% of your efforts give you 80% of the rewards, Mm -hmm. right? Just like in business, 20% of your clients usually bring in 80% of the revenue, right? And so there's always that kind of split. So my goal is to focus on that 20%. And I'll illustrate it this way. I was, um, we have a podcast and we filmed one of them in a, in a shutdown power plant. And the story I told on the podcast, and I'll abbreviate it here, was that one day in a very busy power plant, everything shuts down. I mean, everything just is complete quiet. And the workers are freaking out. They're like, what happened? And they try to fix everything, be really busy, right? And nothing gets fixed the first half an hour or an hour. So the manager, the operations manager gets really scared and he calls a local technician saying, you got to help us, please. He's like, you're lucky. I'm right around the corner. He shows up five minutes later. He walks around the floor of the power plant and just analyzes and does some diagnosis and in the power plant, there are all these like beams. And on these beams are all these uh, electrical boxes, right? And he goes to one specific beam. He goes to one specific box. He opens it up, and inside are all these wires and screws. He turns one specific screw, not even halfway through, and then what happens? Bam, the entire power plant turns back on. And the managers and the employees are so happy. They say, thank you, you saved the day. And he's like, how much do I owe you? And he's like, that will be $10,000. And he was like, wait, wait a second. <laughs> he was like, went to the other's direction. He was like, you were here for like five minutes. You turned one screw. He was like, justify that $10,000. Like, give me an itemized bill. He was like, no problem. He reaches in his pocket, grabs a notebook, scribbles something down, tears a sheet, gives it to him. And the manager looks at it and says, I understand. He goes over to his desk, takes out the checkbook, writes the check, $10,000, gives it to the technician. And if you look at the invoice, it says, Turning screw, $1. Knowing what screw to turn, $9,999. But the lesson here in the story is not that you have a screw loose, the people listening have a screw loose. The lesson here is two things. Number one, knowledge is not only power today, knowledge is profit, right? It's not even that it's, yes, there, there's a division between those who have and those who don't have. But there's also a clear division between those who know something and those who don't know. And those who know can make better decisions, right? Going back to that quote in Limitless, life is a life is a letter C between B and D. B is birth, D is death, life C, choice. And we can make better choices when we know something. And that's why the faster you learn, the faster you earn. That's why I focus my career on teaching accelerated learning and brain optimization. But going back to this, when you know something other people don't, you have you have choice and you have power. And you also have profit, right? But the other part of it, the lesson I took out of it, is it was one screw that turned everything else on. And to answer your question in terms of productivity, I'm obsessed with those handful of screws and nothing else really matters to me. And all those screws don't take a whole lot of time to put focus into. I'll do other things, certainly. But I want to make sure, they call it, um, my buddy Jay co-authored a book called The One Thing, right? And he talks about a lead domino. And the lead domino is like the one domino you hit and all the other dominoes fall. I'm obsessed with that, right? Because what does it do? I don't have to be busy. I could be effective Mm. by focusing on the thing that really matters. So this is kind of a framework or an understanding or a lens to look at everyone's productivity to saying, do I really need to be stressed about this? And is there, you could ask a new dominant question and saying, what's the lead domino? What's that screw that can make everything in here easier? And um, I'm obsessed with that. My, one of my questions for productivity is, how do I make this easier and enjoy the process? And then all of a sudden I get better answers because then I could, learn, I could work smart, not hard. And then I say, how do I bring more joy to this? And I'm like, okay, this is fun. 
Right. And then so but we control it. And that's part of state regulation and management also. I think that concept will take a little while to yeah. get ingrained in society <laughs> because <laughs> we've been so programmed to uh, approach it in a different way. But that's beautiful. And you do touch on so many different techniques, even, you know, immediate tools that you yeah. can use, like the Pomodoro effect that you mentioned. Mm-hmm. And you also talk about, which I actually love, the thinking hats method yeah. by Dr. Edward De Bono. Yeah. Can you expand on that one? Absolutely. So most people don't make great decisions, or maybe if they feel they don't make great decisions because they were never taught how. Like, where was that class also? So the chapters in the book are based on having your mental superpowers. So chapter on focus, chapter on memory, chapter on speed reading and, and learning. And one of the chapters is on thinking, because we are compensated in today's economy for our ability to think, right? And because it's not like it was hundreds of years ago where it's muscle power, today it is mind power, right? Mm -hmm. So imagine, let's make this part of a workshop. (laughs) Everyone think about a decision or a dilemma that you need to make. So you could share it online if you want and tag us, but a decision or dilemma that you're struggling with doesn't have to be the biggest thing in your life, but just something that's more more important than what you're going to eat for dinner, right? Okay, so you have this. Here's the framework. I want you to imagine you have a table in front of you like we do, and there are six hats on there. You can make them any kind of hats that you want, but I'm going to make each one a different color. And what's going to happen is as you're facing this situation, I want you, as you're thinking about it, reach out in front of you, and I want you to find the white hat, all right? And just feel like you're putting on. Even if you move your body, just imagine you're putting on the white hat. And what this technique allows you to do is to get outside of yourself. Because the problem with thinking is we're used to doing it. We have 60,000 thoughts when we're thinking, right, every day. The problem is 95% of those thoughts are the same thoughts we had yesterday and the day before that. So how do we create a new result if we're just the same? So this allows you to get out and think different in a way that's you could act as if, right? Mm-hmm. You, could, you, could, you could fake it till you make it. So you mm-hmm. put on the white hat. And what the white hat means is you have to look at this situation and just look at the information, the facts, right? The white hat, and I'll give everyone a mnemonic, you know, a memory tip, like a white lab coat, a scientist. You have to look at this pro- problem or the situation as if you're a scientist and weigh the facts, right? And that's the only way you can look at it, all right? So I'm going to do that and then take off the white hat. And then now I want everyone to look for the red hat and grab the red hat and put it on. And now you're not logical at all. The red hat represents like the heart, red emotion. You're just going to feel this situation. How does this feel to you? And how, when you're looking at the solutions, how, do, how does each one feel? How is this part of your decision? Or if you make this decision, how, what is the emotional state that it puts you in? Even your intuition, what does your gut tell you? Take off the red hat. I want you to grab the black hat. So put on the black hat. And what I want everyone to do now, you're not, it's no longer the facts, it's no longer emotion. The black hat, like a judge wearing a black robe, is this is the judgment hat. Like what could go wrong here? Right? You know, this is the pa- there's power in negative thinking also. Being, you know, devil's advocate is there's, there's power in that. Because sometimes take off the black hat and reach for the yellow hat. Put on the yellow hat. Yellow like the sun is like optimistic. What's everything that could go right here? Right? And some people operate just from a yellow hat, but the problem is they don't see like the risk and what could go wrong. So that's why it's useful to put on the black hat sometimes to see, to, you know, to, to manage that risk. You put on the yellow hat and it's just like, this is opt- optimistic. What's all the things that could go right? All right, take off the yellow hat. And the last two hats, I want you to grab the green hat. Put on the green hat. And now it's not about facts or our feelings. It, green is about growth. Like you think about, you know, a green tree or plant. It just grows. So this is about possibility. So this is like thinking out of the box. So let's say you're facing a situation. Should I take this career or should I start my own business? Maybe green hat, you're thinking, maybe I go back to school, right? It's, it's something that you haven't considered before. It's, the green is creativity. Finally, take the green hat off and search for the last hat, which is the blue hat, and put it on. Now the blue hat is like the blue sky. It's up there and it looks and it manages everything else. And so the blue hat always comes last. It doesn't matter the other sequence, everything else could change. But the blue listens to everything that the other hats said 
and then it's the manager hat, right? The big sky, and it makes the final decision for you. So it's a wonderful way because sometimes our personalities, we just do everything from feeling. We're always, so many people, 90% of the time, they're wearing their red hat and they're just, everything is based on feeling, but then they don't look at the facts. They don't look at the downside. They don't look at green opportunity and so on. And they commit to the hat. Like it becomes their identity. They wear it all the time and that's the only way they operate. I love that visualization exercise of even being able to close the eyes and go through each hat at the time. That's amazing. Um, I want to... Talk about the brain's animal code, because that's something that I um, found extremely useful. Um, I went on the website, the Academy's website, Mm -hmm. uh, and did the quiz where I got a little bit more information about, a lot actually, information about the way my brain operates. So tell me a little bit about... So this is uh, another new chapter in in the book, and it's about, I realized that when people, I've been using this specific assessment for the past few years with one-on-one coaching clients. And for the first time, we're offering it up to the public. And there's a whole chapter on it, and there's a free quiz online. People could go to mybrainanimal.com. There's nothing to buy. It just takes four minutes, multiple choice, very easy. Kind of like when people take a quiz like, what Harry Potter character are you or Game Mm -hmm. of Thrones character, right? Um, So it's fun, and you get some great art with it, and it gives you a prescriptive way based on your brain animal on how to learn and how to lead and do other things. And so the quick of it, quote-unquote, is um, I pulled when I created this from multiple modalities, science and psychologies, so um, personality types like Myers-Briggs, pulled from introvert and extrovert. I pulled from uh, sciences like uh, lateral brain dominance, like left brain, right brain. I also pulled from multiple intelligence theory, how regardeners work out of Harvard, right? And this all informed, and we can learning styles, visual, auditory, kinesthetic. And I put it into these this quiz, only a couple dozen questions, very simple. And what it reveals is how you learn, how you think, how you communicate, and how you make decisions, how you buy, how you invest. Uh, how you parent, all these things. And I know it's a big promise, but when you do it, you start getting follow-up reports on how to be more productive through your day based on your animal. So it's very simply brain code, C-O-D-E. And these are the, the, the they stand for the four animals. The C is the cheetah. And the cheetah are, they act really quickly. That's who I am. <laughs> yes, they, they, they have strong intuition and they also thrive in, in fast-paced environments. They're, they're used to their ability to adapt. Again, they have strong intuition and those are the people that just put things into action, right? The O are your owls and your owls really lean into logic uh, they like data. They like to research everything. They have some facts and figures. Now, just thinking about that, a cheetah would communicate different than an owl. You know, a cheetah would also operate different than an owl, invest different than an owl, right? The D are the D stands for dolphins, and these are your uh, creative visionaries. You know, sometimes they're an entrepreneur and they can see a future that other people can't, can't quite see yet. So they use a lot of their imagination. They're good at pattern recognition. And finally, the E are your elephants. And your elephants are your collaborators. They have high level, they're defined by with having high levels of empathy and they bring people together. And so it's interesting. Let me use some examples here because we, we had our team, a few dozen people, in different places in the world take it. And our customer experience team, support team, they are 100% elephants. Wow. Because high levels of empathy, they're community builders and so on. Our CFO, you know, financial officer, is an owl. Right? And, but we didn't test this beforehand. This was something that you gravitate towards your strengths right? and your own personality. Even if you take uh, pop culture, if you look at uh, a show like Friends, mm-hmm. Ross would be an owl. He's a scientist. He's a researcher, reads lots of books. Um, let's say Joey, cheetah, fast acting, right? on, on, in, on intuition, adapts quick. And uh, you would say, let's say, Phoebe would be a creative dolphin, right? (laughs) With with her music, with her art. And then you have somebody like Monica. And Monica brought everyone together, always wanted to host all the parties and be the center of of that. She would be an elephant. Mm -hmm. She builds community and keeps people together. So you'll see this in everything. Wait, who's Rachel? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, so Rachel, Rachel would be, what would you think in a combination? Maybe a combination. combination. And by the way, we're not yeah. any just one. Yeah. Right? You have a primary, 
but you have a secondary. Just like if you're right-handed, doesn't mean you don't use your left hand, mm-hmm. right? It's just when you use your right hand, things are easier. And this is interesting for people to do because so many people share this with their spouse, with their kids, with their team, because it, sh- it takes the judgment out of it and it would explain a lot of their behavior. And in the benefit of when you go uh, to uh, mybrainanimal.com, you get this detailed report and more coming on how to apply this towards your reading. Because a, re- a cheetah would read differently than an owl, right? An, an owl's looking at the, going all the data, going really slow, getting all the facts, make sure comprehension. You know, a cheetah's going more sprints, right? Uh, and then somebody like a, a dolphin is great creative. We'd be imagining everything as they're, re- you know, everyone has different strategies. So I show you how to do that towards your memory to remember names and, and so much more. It's a lot of fun. No, I found it extremely helpful and I'm looking forward to continue getting more information. Again, more information so I can become more acquainted with how my brain works and how I can support it. Um, and I really wanted to touch on this. I know this is the um, addition mm-hmm. to the book, the whole section about AI, about yeah. where we at in terms of um, that, because I feel like there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of curiosity around yeah. it. Um, we have all these technologies, and we have all these wonderful technologies and a lot of investment there. But then our education system hasn't really changed. Yeah, that's true. So I'm very curious to hear how do you see that working. Yeah. So for me, technology is always there to support us on our journey. It's to, there to assist us, not replace us. And for me, AI is not artificial intelligence as much as it is augmented intelligence, right? It's it's there to augment our performance. My question when I was writing this chapter was, especially for the world that we're in, is how do you use AI to enhance your HI, your human intelligence? Mm-hmm. So a couple of examples I could give for people is, let's say... Um, you want we mentioned the word neuroplasticity, and you don't you want to look it up, and, and you could do that on Wikipedia or something, or you could go to AI and say, "Explain to me neuroplasticity as if I am eight years old," and that will give you an amazing foundation for what it what it is, right? You could do something like I have a podcast as, as you. Sometimes if I don't get the book in time, like sent to me, and I don't like reading on screens because I don't need another excuse to read it on a screen. I like the physical book. Then I'll say, in, I'll say, summarize this person's book to me in this way in this many minutes, and I'll read. And I'll read that instead. Mm-hmm. Or even as a podcast, you know, I come up with questions, but I'll also go in and put it in the, the person I'm speaking with and saying, hey. I'm going to be interviewing this person. What are some thoughtful questions for this particular community, you know, my community, uh, that they have maybe haven't been asked before, right? So it's all ways. And you'll find that er- nearly every principle in Limitless expanded memory principles, you could use an AI. Speed reading principles, you could use an AI. You could use AI to, to test your reading speed, to test your reading comprehension. For memory, there are principles in there called space repetition. And you could set up AI where they do active retrieval, where they're going to actually quiz you to see how well you know a subject, right? Mm -hmm. So these are, uh, and you can give it, you know, give me words to memorize in terms of vocabulary. I talk about mind mapping and memory palaces. Well, you could go into AI and say, hey, I want to learn this to give a speech. Can you build me a memory palace or mind palace? And it'll actually walk you through a story mm-hmm. like that. And so it's a wonderful way to augment. You still have to use your own intelligence and your own gifts, but it's a wonderful way to have a, a support. I think there will be a phase of us still, I mean, we're still learning how to use it properly, but yeah. I definitely going to be an educational uh, journey for us to get there, to be able to uh, use it for our own benefit, yeah. uh, rather for our own our own. <laughs> you know, like I don't remember. The yeah, <laughs> I, I, I have a very optimistic view on on AI and technology. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I think AI technology. We we don't want to be completely dependent on any technology, right? Like your phone could keep all your phone numbers. Great, that's convenient. But we should still improve our memory so we could remember things also as well. Same thing with AI. You could use it as a creative tool to help you to write or come up with uh, you know a caption for a post or a title for YouTube. But you don't, you know, it's just a creative partner. Yeah. Uh, and you could take it or leave it or build on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Jim, thank you so much. I mean, this book has, like I mentioned in the beginning of our video, has so many uh, practical steps, advice, action to take, uh, but also really makes you think and try to 
learn how to ask yourself the right questions um, and to just be curious, which is a huge thing for me. I love books that make me more curious. And I think you did such an amazing job with this one. So um, anyone who hasn't had an opportunity to read Limitless, I uh, highly recommend, especially with the new addition now to the yeah, book. Yeah, people could go to limitlessbook.com. And when you do that, you'll actually get a 13, there, there are a lot of uh, brain training gifts that will help, it will help you. So in the when you actually receive the book, you'll be a faster reader, have better focus, and even some things on AI that goes deeper. Amazing. So, yeah, and then definitely, can I challenge everyone to do one thing? I want everyone to go to the My Brain Animal, and when you find out what your animal is, post it. There's some art that we give you. You can post it online and tag us both so we get to see it. And um, and again, for that too, uh, because you tag us, we'll get to see it. And tell me if you feel like it's accurate. And we'll repost. I'll repost some of our favorites, and actually, I'll gift a gift a couple of copies to your community just as a thank you. Wonderful. And of course, we have the book, um, mm-hmm. and you have a podcast. Yeah, people could go just in my Instagram, and we could follow each other and get get each other there. And there's a link there that has ninety five percent of what we publish is free. Podcasts, uh, our, our YouTube. We have over one point three million subscribers there. We put daily. We put a lot of content out there. So just our goal is to build better, brighter brains. No, no, no brain left behind. I love that. Thank you, Jim, so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't miss my newest episode right here. And if you're listening to the podcast on Apple or Spotify, please go and leave a review with your biggest takeaway. I love reading your thoughts. And if you have any suggestions for guests or topics, you can leave them in the comment section. And always, always remember, you are not alone.